Go ahead, Charlie. All right. Uh, welcome to meeting. Uh, let's see here. Welcome to meeting number. Uh, where are we at? 3,765 of the college of complexes, the playground for people who think. Now, we have two basic rules at the college of complexes. The first of which is one full at a time, and the second of which is no personal attacks. We have a specific format uh, with a presentation followed by question and answers, and these should be questions. All right, well, the third part is our rebuttal yeah. remarks period, wow. which everyone will be afforded a brief opportunity to speak. And the last part is the speaker has a final uninterrupted comments. Okay, now, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On May the 11th, D. Knight, an author and activist uh, from out of town, has written a book, an updated edition of his book on how to achieve peace in the world. And he calls it a realistic path to peace from genocide to global war and how we can stop war. Should be a good one. On May the 18th, we're going to have two speakers on nuclear energy and nuclear waste. Uh, David Kraft of NEIS and Kevin Camps of the Radioactive Waste Watchdog Group. So all about nuclear energy. On May the 25th, Tim and Andy will tell you this is very serious. A plot that is being ensued is being planned to steal the upcoming presidential election. Uh, this They're using legals. So this is a way to see what they're planning in advance. Very important for all voters. On June the 1st, young man Tom O'Donnell, he's, he's wondering why. Life is not financially fair. Why is there social stratification? Why are there rich and poor people? Why are there people in need while others have plenty? Very important essential question we should all ask. On June the 8th, we're going to be talking about group has not been to the college. This is ecological evening on migratory bird migrations and how they fly around cities and have difficulty due to lights. And that was on the front food. page of local newspapers recently, picking mm -hmm. people picking up dead birds who ran into windows. Right, Janice, let them finish the announcement. Yeah, that's fine. All right. On June the 15th, our own Sid Cohen will be returning to talk about Marxism, specifically its operating mechanism, which is called dialectical materialism. If you want to know how communism operates, this is the, the day, the program you will be able to find out. On June the 22nd, we have a retired academic who's pursuing ecological issues, and he is describing that climate crisis is inevitable if unless we get rid of capitalism. Wow. He blames capitalism entirely. For the climate crisis. He said no lions or animals will survive it, unless we get rid of it. On July the 6th, here's Julie Charles Paydock. We'll be talking to their fourth to the July program. How about June 29th, Charlie? Oh, June 29th. June 29th, uh, we're going to be looking. This is another important program. The Republicans, the Heritage Foundation, has come up with the Project 2025, which are their plans on how to reconfigure government. And all each age, this is very detailed. It goes into hundreds of pages. All, all the things that they want to do and weren't able to do during the Trump administration. So the day one, from when they claim Trump will be elected, re-elected, they're going to be off and rolling to fix what they think the government of the United States. So that's the 29th. On July the 6th again, 
I'll be talking about what I uncover, what I believe are 25 mistakes the United States has made. Actually, it's not really mistakes. It's more, more phrase it this way. It's 25 things that I think the United States should do. 25 solutions to problems that exist in the United States. So 25 things that I think the United States should do. Speakers will be invited to present what they think the United States should do in terms of policies and practices. So do you have any ideas of what we should do? On July the 13th, this guy was just recently on the Art Bell Coast to Coast radio show, but he's a veteran. He's a filmmaker uh, on, on geoengineering and chemistries and weather modification. So Matt Landman will be joining us on July the 13th. That leaves two dates open in July. So if you'd like to speak, please furnish a title and a written description of your proposed program. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. Take it away. All right, let's welcome uh, Joe Kopsik to the podium. Joe, are you ready? Go ahead and start speaking. I I... Oh, I'm sorry, yes, so who else has announcements? Karina, why don't you come on up and give it up at the mic. I don't have any announcements. Right. Do you have any announcements, Yeah. We don't need the boost. Okay, do you have any uh, announcements? Go ahead, go ahead, get up front. Go ahead. No, they're taking over the world. <laughs> okay, this is an uh, announcement. I have an article in the student newspaper about Gaza. I can hand it out if people want it. Thank you. Oh, gosh. That's the announcement. Any other I announcements? Have to send it out. Any other, any other announcements? Thank you. All right, Joe, if you're ready, let's get you started here. I got your PowerPoint ready. All to right. Just, just if Joe, if you want to come up front and use the mic out and just hold it, that's something else. If you want to do it. Try to be able to see the screen and, uh, move, no, the, it's, move, the, move please, the podium forward a little bit. Okay. All right. So speaking of announcements, I also have some literature back there. I'm currently running for 60th District, Illinois State Assembly. That's the lower house. Um, I have some information about my former opponent in the U.S. House, Brett Schneider, and uh, some other articles I've written. Thanks for having me. Happy May Day. Um, we'll be talking about labor issues and the free market tonight. Uh, can you start the slide? That's exactly what I'm going to do. Sure. So a different font from the way I designed it. There might be a few formatting issues. I hope you can see everything, but uh, I'm gonna follow <laughs> along here. So tonight, my talk is called The Rigged Economy and Rigged Market and Why Congress Should Repeal the Taft Harvey Act. A little, bit, a little bit of background. Here's the me. microphone. Sure. Um, uh, we can pull it up a little bit for you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that works. Yeah. So uh, my name is Joe Kopsik. I'm a blogger, self-published author, and frequent candidate. I run for U.S. House, now running for state house, as I said. Uh, former Libertarian Party member, recently joined the Green Party up in Lake County, about two hours north of here. This is my fourth time presenting at College Complexes. I uh, majored in political science at UW-Madison. I didn't study labor law directly there, but I did study constitutional law, and I got interested in free market theory and libertarianism and um, in radical union ideas around the same time. So I started forming my own independent ideas. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So um, I wasn't in Wisconsin when Scott Walker passed Act 10, curtailing some public workers' uh, rights to collectively bargain. But I did move to Wisconsin shortly after. So I got a chance to study that and write a bunch of articles about it right after college, uh, put it on my blog. So like I said, I just left the Libertarian Party and have joined the Green Party. Um, and the question you might be asking is, why would a Green Party supporter want freer markets and why should Green support freer markets? Uh, there's some excellent diagrams and Venn diagrams I created that explain this. Uh, I wish I could have added this presentation. If you email me, I can send those to you. 
Uh, there's a lot of things that Green Party and Libertarians agree on. That's uh, voluntarism and um, decentralization and nonviolence and peace. Um, and also anti-monopoly, which is one of the main things I'll be talking about tonight. Um, so a lot of people think that free markets means tyranny for big corporations. It doesn't necessarily, depending on who does it and how it's done. Um, free markets ideally would be making it easier for ordinary people to start businesses as long as they don't exploit workers or the environment and freeing consumers and taxpayers to be able to boycott anything and everything they want, including potentially the government, but mostly consumer goods, corrupt uh, businesses that, are, that people think are defrauding them or that are selling what they consider to be toxins or poisons. Um, people don't people don't want to have to work for companies they don't want to support or buy companies uh, buy from companies they don't want to support. So let me know when the next slide advances. Sure, I'm sorry. I uh, I skipped a couple of slides there. You can actually skip all about five. Just do it very slowly. I'll just summarize what I said. We'll coordinate better. Sorry about that. So that's the background of me. Those uh, articles I've written about labor law and skip forward more articles. Follow my blog, aquarianagrarian.blogspot.com. Go ahead. Um, why are Green Party supporters uh, support freer markets? Because uh, go ahead some more. So I've left the Libertarian Party for the Green Party because I feel like Libertarians are good at recognizing intrusions into the free market uh, or the market because you don't have free markets. And also because there's a debate within Libertarian circles as to whether the markets are free yet. Uh, Ron Paul admitted that the free markets are not free yet. He said, we haven't tried free markets. Uh, I have a libertarian friend who said, we tried it briefly in the 1880s, but keep in mind, rights for blacks and women, including in the market, weren't fully developed, let's just say, by that point. So it wasn't full free markets. Um, but I'm here to say that markets aren't free, and that's partially a good thing and partially a bad thing. It's complicated, but it's mostly a bad thing. You can skip forward. So... Um, like I said, Libertarians and Greens have some agreements. Um, and the issue I want to focus on tonight is voluntary purchase and being able to resist and refuse compelled purchase. And uh, I want to find ways that promote more freedom and fairness for both workers and consumers, since most people who work also buy things. Um, libertarians and Greens should work together to make sure that governors and presidents and antitrust commissions um, do something about the problem of monopolies, whether that's breaking them up. People more on the left would say more like tax them more, but you know, we need to have real antitrust. So I'm gonna talk about monopolies later. So, and both sides support equal protection under the law. So there's some idea of equality. So we need to promote equality and freedom at the same time. But I, I, wanna, I wanna preserve free market structures by increasing you know, the level of voluntary purchase and decreasing the level of compelled purchase. So we're good on the slide. Like I said, some people think free market means tyranny for big corporations. That's only if you don't believe that the state has no power to give corporations all their power in the first place. And it, it does. So um, people think that Bitcoin is an alternative to the dollar. And I'll get into this more when I talk about financial monopoly. Um, so Basically, the idea is that I think Greens and, uh, are going to be better libertarians at spotting all the things that rig the markets and all the monopolies and eliminating them. But mainly, we're here tonight to talk about how to make the market more free for labor and for the market for representation of workers, um, more free and more fair, and talk about which legal reforms in the market would help both workers and consumers thrive financially. And skip forward to okay. So the Taft-Hartley Act, the main piece of legislation I'm here to discuss, is intended to address large wave of strikes which happened right after World War II. The purpose of the bill included mediating labor disputes that affected commerce, and equalizing the legal responsibilities for labor organizations and employers. So forward. Our purposes and methods provide additional facilities for the mediation of labor and disputes affecting commerce, promote full flow of commerce, avoid industrial strife, interfering with that commerce, preventing strikes and lockouts, which they, which the government considered coercive activity. Um, that's debatable, that's what I'm here to talk about. And to prevent strikes from turning into national emergencies and interrupting the delivery of healthcare. And how that was gonna be achieved by amending the Wagner Act, which is the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, FDR's main piece of labor law. 
uh, by having employers, employees, and labor organizations recognize each other's rights and make sure that each acknowledges and neither has the rights to engage in practices which jeopardize the public health or safety. It's several organizations, including the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service and Director, the National Labor Management Panel, to address those issues. And skip ahead. I'm trying to do that now. Sure. Uh, well, what it does in terms of legally, uh, it amends Section 8 of the 1935 National Labor Relations Act, um, which prohibited employers from interfering with employees as they engage in concerted activity. Concerted activity is a way which every worker has to engage in. Any two, any two people can engage in concerted activity, which is a coordinated activity, to form a union, to form a new union. So the Wagner Act prohibits employers from interfering with that. Um, Taft-Hartley amended that. Section 14B of Taft-Hartley allows states to enact right to work laws which ban union shops and closed shops, which are agreements that allow either only unionized people or only people in a particular union. So Taft-Hartley Act is why right to work laws exist. And those laws allow workers in the unionized shop to opt out of paying dues and becoming a member of the union. Uh, opponents of right to work laws call this the right to work for less law and the right to be a scab or a strike breaker. And uh, proponents of right to work laws say this is, it protects the right to continue working. In Quiet the, in the restaurant, please. Protects the right to continue working in the event of a strike. Prevents your right to refuse to join any union. Uh, what it does in terms of its effect on what workers and unions are able to do, it prohibits solidarity actions. The government considers these unfair labor practices, which again is debatable. These include secondary boycotts, solidarity strikes, and secondary picketing and mass picketing. These are actions which occur in multiple firms or industries at the same time. It also prohibits, Taft Harley Act prohibits jurisdictional strikes, which is refusal to work unless particular employees are given the appropriate assignment and wildcat strikes, which are strikes which occur without the permission of union members. And it also prohibits political strikes, which are intended to achieve policy change, and prohibits monetary donations by unions to federal political campaigns, but that was repealed. More details on that. So back to Taft-Hartley. Um, sorry, next step. Yeah, but first I'm um, gonna talk about free markets, rig markets, anarcho-capitalism, and how to define those things. I already talked a little bit about corporate tyranny, but I'll cover it again. And how are some, where are some ways in the market can become rigged, including eight ways the government does it and one way that non-governmental agents- Can you speak up, please? It's hard to hear. Sure, I'm sorry. So again, I'm gonna talk about free markets versus rigged markets and how to define them. Next slide. So Noam Chomsky was act, asked what he thinks about Ron Paul in, I think, 2011 or 2014. He said, uh, libertarian ideology may sound nice on the surface, but if you think it through, it's just a call for corporate tyranny. It takes away any barrier to corporate tyranny, but it's all academic. The business world would never permit it to happen because it would destroy the economy. They can't live without a powerful state, and we know it. He's talking about businesses and corporations. Essentially, he's saying businesses can't live without a powerful state. Now, here's the thing, libertarians know that and they want to stop government from supporting businesses. They want to remove supports from businesses so that we can have an actually free market. I'm just saying that myself, green parties who are looking at monopolies and taking it seriously might do better at libertarians at spotting those monopolies and finding ways to get rid of them. Next slide. So free markets versus free enough markets, that's liberal markets under statism. Uh, liberal markets under statism, which is what we have now, um, is regulation means legislation. But in the opinion of libertarians and free market supporters, regulation means keeping the flow of commerce regular, i.e. it's normal, meaning no undue interruption by the government, no states imposing tariffs on each other, and no state governments uh, unfairly giving assistance, more assistance to in-state domestic labor and capital as opposed to that of the other states. There have to be fair bids, fair bidding going on to perform services in other states. Um, that could be freer. I mean, there's a lot of road building that's going on that I think in-state companies have an edge on doing the contract. And we'll talk about exclusive contracts later on. 
So under the liberal market democracy conception, uh, government promises to ensure people against business fraud and labor exploitation. However, the problem is that that often fails and results in people being unfree to sue um, pharmaceutical companies, for example. And under a total free market system, we would have ideally just self-government and private sector government. And uh, people like Robert P. Murphy and Samuel E. Konkin have talked about or written about ideas like private law and private security, where people could be free to choose who defends and protects them, wouldn't be forced to accept the military and police's monopoly on that, and insurance agencies, insurance agencies and underwriters, they would make dangerous things prohibitively expensive instead of having uh, like Congress just prohibit things. Instead of making something illegal, you make it so expensive that a person would have to pay a lot I guess to the public or the people they could potentially hurt, you know, it would be worked out. But the idea is it would be negotiated without the state getting involved. I can talk more about ideal free markets uh, in the question section if you want. I'm trying to get it up to dancing that system, having sure. So that's just kind of a summary of how the markets are not really free enough yet to be able to call it a free market system. <laughs> um, how to prove that we have so, free markets? Yeah, that was a mistake. That's the typo. I was supposed to. That was supposed to say how to prove that we don't have free markets. Please excuse me. So one way to do that is to analyze uh, statistical studies, which is not my area of expertise. Um, the way I'm going to do it tonight is I'm going to provide a lot of examples of ways the markets interfered with or distorted. And this is the way I define rigged markets in a manner that causes us to remunerate much of our money back to our employers and to sellers in the government. Um, so like, say some of us might be receiving uh, assistance from the government. A lot of that money is just going right back to the government or it's going back to businesses that have captured its government agencies. I'll talk about corporate capture more. And another way to prove that we don't have free markets, excuse me again, is this Princeton study from 2014 called Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens. Um, I got it. Okay. So two, two professors have said that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. government policies while average citizens have less or no influence. Next slide. So this Princeton study on oligarchy, um, essentially it means that um, these lobbyists mostly, for the most part, they're lobbying to get taxpayer money to their businesses. Sad to be here. Um, next slide. Sorry, I skipped all that. I didn't have to read all that. Yeah, I can, can publish this to my blog later, yeah. yeah he can also email it to us, we can post it somewhere. Sure. So um, basically my theory of, of this, you know, if the government is an oligarchy, then it's because we have pro-oligopoly businesses that have lobbied the government to pass laws to give favors, or in many cases, direct subsidies to those same business interests. And that's how we prove the markets are rigged. Again, oligopoly means a state of few sellers. And I'll explain details on that soon. Next slide. How can the markets become rigged? And what do I mean by rigged markets? Eight different ways. Next slide. So rigged markets are the opposite of free markets or a free economy. Uh, it's not corporate tyranny. Government, uh, businesses should grow without government assistance in the, in the ideal free market system. And as many government does assist businesses, I'm going to point out tonight. In a free market, supply and demand are allowed to meet, and prices adjust, and markets clear. That is, when goods can no longer be sold, their price drops, that is, unless the government interferes. Um, that has to do with what we call fluidity of markets. Um, and there's something called monopsony, which is a state of one buyer, um, or Single payer is another way to say that. So sometimes the government becomes a monopsony um, by having a single payer system where the government prohibits the private sector from purchasing health insurance. It didn't do that exactly, but that was what was talked about. And setting price floors and ceilings is something else that rigs markets. Um, go back one or two. Sorry. One sec. Okay, no, we're fine. We're fine on the slide. Go back to that one. I'm sorry. That the subsidy should lead to inflation. Thank you. Um, so people, th some people think that subsidizing a company is going to make prices lower, the prices of the goods and services they sell lower. But, and that does happen when it's a good company. It's doing as it's expected to do. 
uh, to make the products more affordable, but we will put them in the pocket the money and then just keep the prices the same as they are, or they'll just even raise the prices and beg for more subsidies the next year. Next slide. Damn it. And then here are some examples. Uh, I know it's a little hard to read, but um, goods and services experiencing the highest price inflation are also made by firms that are among the most heavily subsidized industries, including health and education. So these are the goods which have seen the highest uh, highest price changes in the last 20, 24 years. Uh, next slide. It's another example. So yeah, college costs are out of control. Um, therefore, next slide. So therefore, a rigged economy is a state of affairs. This is how I define rigged economy. A state of affairs in which government effectively, either directly or indirectly, orders people to buy goods or services from certain firms and or from itself government. <laughs> In order state of affairs and government spending and tax revenue has grown so large the number of private businesses and such businesses have difficulty calculating prices. Um, if the economy is also rigged if and when the quote unquote red market um, dominates, which is violent and fraudulent commercial transactions, most of which are currently illegal and should be. So I'll talk more about red markets in the ninth way if the economy is going to become rigged. So the primary way that government rig markets uh, is corporate capture of government. And this facilitates any or all of the following eight things. Next slide. Number one, the use of state violence to protect property claims. And I'll get to more details later. Uh, exclusive or exclusionary claims over vast swaths of land. Unreasonable claims of property. that are currently being protected through the use of state violence and the police tool of violence. Jake, can you mute yourself, please? Number two, sorry, this is cut off. Government intervention into the economy to choose winners and losers in the marketplace by propping up and bailing out failing businesses. So bailouts and loans is basically number two, preventing markets from clearing um, too much taxation, spending out of control, price uh, distortions of price calculation. Uh, go back to number three, please. Another way to rig the market is lobbying by corporations and government contractors to award exclusive contracts, effectively compelling citizens to purchase goods or services through the process of taxation and subsidization. I want you to remember that phrase, the process of taxation and subsidization. Essentially, it's government stealing our money or extorting our money and giving it to businesses that we might not want to buy from or work for. So this is uh, number three is compelled purchase and exclusive contracts, which are connected. And number three and four, I think four is cut up. Number four is government support of unnatural monopolies, artificial, unnatural, and undeserved monopolies, and enforcing claims of companies that are monopolies. Uh, some examples include land hoarding, uh, Bill Gates's claims on large amounts of land, other large landowners. Uh, military is one of the biggest landowners, for example. And government also holds up all these monopolies on most of the government services it provides. I'll give examples of those later. Next slide. Next slide, please. Number five. I'm trying to get it. Sure. The fifth way to rig the market, uh, government support of oligopolies and oligopsonies, and also monopolies. I think that's, uh, yeah. I was supposed to say, uh, that was supposed to include monopolies. So monopolies and oligopolies are both part of number five when government acts as a monopoly. So oligopoly, uh, you don't want to remember that it's a state of few sellers. Just remember, it's, it's basically a near monopoly. Oligopoly is a near monopoly. Um, number six, six way to break the market is when the government creates unfair, unreasonable, and or expensive barriers of entry into or out of the market. That is the markets for selling goods, labor, services. I'll talk about examples of barriers of entry later. Those impede uh, natural flow of the market. The government causes a lot of them. Number seven, seventh way to rig the market. State grants of legal and economic privileges and immunities, privileges and immunities to business. That's what number seven is, which others don't enjoy. Immunity from lawsuits, insulation from competition, that is, insulation from competition against their competitors, business colluding with government to craft laws that kind of subtly crowd out, uh, you know, cut out the business of people who are trying to enter the market. It kind of has to do with the barriers of entry that I just talked about. So a lot of these things are in, interrelated and prop each other up. 
Um, businesses enjoy low rates on loans and utilities that others don't enjoy. And like I said, in number one, the state violence, state endorsed violence upholds and enforces all these claims. Number eight, uh, most of it's cut off, blurring of the line between what constitutes a private sector entity versus a public sector entity. There's things called private public partnerships. Um, there are laws that regulate the use of private property under vaguely defined circumstances. Nonsensical differences between a private security guard, which I am, versus the duties of military and police is an example. And uh, there's a sector that I'm gonna talk about in a minute that's not talked about very much. There's two different ways of defining so-called third sector, whereas the first is the public, the second is uh, private. Talk more about security in the monopoly section. So number one, we're gonna go back over these again just to get a bunch more detail. So this, I'll try to make this short. Use of state violence to protect and enforce property claims. So we're supposed to have free, we're supposed to be free to compete over parcels of land. If someone can use it better, they should be able to. And if someone's able to exercise dominion over a land claim for years and years and generations and they aren't using it, um, if they're using it, fine. But if they're not using it, that's something that uh, supporters of Henry George and mutualists have questioned. It's the thing called occupancy and use norms. So we need to recognize that the government operates uh, in the same way that private businesses operate sometimes, including using violence to enforce its claims. And like I said, again, the government owns a whole lot of land. Uh, if you read sociologist Max Weber, he said that uh, um, government or the, the state, he defined the state as an agency capable of wielding a legitimate um, monopoly over the use of violence, a monopoly over the use of legitimate violence within a given territory. And that's the idea that libertarians talk about when they say it's, it's not voluntary, the state is violent, and it's monopolistic, it upholds monopolies. Um, next slide. Government upholds exploitative contracts, which allow exploitation of land or labor, and allow takings of land um, in the, let's see, um, or contracts that condemn people to involuntary servitude, um, contracts that are vaguely worded. If government upholds these contracts, it could risk people's lives or result in nonsensical situations where people are doing things they're not really, they didn't expect they were supposed to do. Like, um, for example, there was a case, uh, I can't remember the name of the Supreme Court justice. Um, he was under fire because he supported the upholding of a contract that obligated a driver to stay in a uh, freezing truck. Um, and he, it risked death. So he, if he left the truck to try to survive, he would have lost his job. That's an example of a labor contract that wouldn't be upheld, um, that shouldn't be upheld. So when the government enforces that, it kills people. So maybe you know, there's something in the Constitution that said um, the right to contract shouldn't be questioned or something like that. Uh, government should uphold all voluntary contracts. And libertarian would say that's that's fine. That's the way it should work. But when it risks death, you gotta ask yourself, what are you doing there? Another problem of uh, contracts is when patents last too long. Uh, from what I understand, the average patent used to last 20 years and now it's extended sometimes up to 100 years, depending on what you're talking about. Like Disney got 100 years somehow. Medical devices get 14, 20 years or something. Uh, and patents are a monopoly. They're a temporary monopoly on the use of an invention takes government violence through the patent office to uphold that because like there's such a thing as independent discoveries like libertarians don't really believe in enforcement of patent claims because what if someone else discovered it at the same time why do you need violence to exclusively profit from something that you invented for, especially for more than 20 years if you go more than 20 years start asking questions but limited patents would be the limited government solution next slide Oh, yeah, actually, we're fine. So how land is protected and who does it? Uh, the recorder of deeds in each county registers land claims. Uh, borders, including uh, border security, including ICE, um, protect those border claims, which is part of land. And the physical property protections are provided by police, military, state license, security guard. See, some states have regulations requiring security mm -hmm. guards to be uh, licensed, and some states don't. I think Wisconsin does, and I could be wrong. Illinois definitely does. And there's many intelligence agencies and homeland security agency that claims to protect the land, the homeland. Next slide. So there's an anarchist mutualist named Pierre Joseph Proudhon who said that property is impossible. Essentially, this means that it would um, property claims 
ex exploitative property claims um, are unsustainable and untenable without the use of state violence to prop up the claim. That is, unless there's popular support that that person actually owns and deserves that piece of property and is using it. And uh, when you exclude people from property, you enclose the commons. Um, the commons basically doesn't exist anymore. Um, and they're, in the Scottish Highlands, they have mass trespassing events because it's impossible to get to the commons that's, that do still exist there without trespassing on someone's property. So there should be an easement in those places, but they protest in, in, uh, in protest, uh, excuse me, they trespass in protest. So what I was talking about before, occupancy and use norms. Uh, every parcel of land should be open to competition. So to use violence to prevent that competition, uh, aka that, that property should be open to purchase every once in a while, um, so you, you create a problem. You basically cause us to have to ask a question, uh, who gets to decide who owns what property? Should the community have a right or should the person who's using it best? And how do you define best? Things like that. Next slide. So converting, like prohibiting the private property ownership of land is a good thing, according to libertarians, but it would create a problem according to people who support this occupancy and use terms thing. Um, the, the unquestioned, exclusive, exploitative use of land, especially and hoarding, allowing land to fall into disrepair. Like I said, this includes people like Georgists, uh, mutualists, and other hybrid philosophies, left-wing libertarians. Um, Benjamin, Benjamin Tucker said that there are four main monopolies. Land is one of them. I'll get to the other four at some point. Um, these schools of thought also embrace the idea that land is the only natural monopoly. The full definition of land is land, water, air, and minerals under the land, and the electromagnetic spectrum, including radio waves. So these are things that are naturally monopolized, and therefore each community, we could expect that the community would try to monopolize these things. But communists and Georgists would say, like, only government regulation of the commons is all is necessary to have efficient government, basically. That's what they would say. Um, now we're moving on to the second thing of aid, the rigged markets uh, involving corporate capture is economic in interventionism and protectionism. When government chooses winners and losers in the marketplace, which is a saying that Ron Paul had, propping up and bailing out failing businesses, um, giving unfair advantages to domestic labor and capital, spending too much money, taxing too much. Next slide. So another of Benjamin Tucker's four monopolies is money. Like I said, you should look into a guy named Brock Pierce. If you think Bitcoin is good, there's a guy named Brock Pierce who was probably the first guy to teach Jeffrey Epstein about Bitcoin at his island at a thing called the 2011 Mindshift Conference. And uh, Brock Pierce, there's articles that connect Brock Pierce to Janet Yellen, the chair of the Federal Reserve, I think former chair now, and Tether, which is a type of uh, cryptocurrency that's tethered to the value of the US dollar. So Bitcoin might not be an effective alternative or a full complete alternative to the US dollar. That's why the dollar still basically has a monopoly. It has a legal monopoly. Uh, Federal Reserve Act existed for about um, 111 years now. It's, it doesn't describe itself as government, but it's government authorized, it's congressionally authorized. Of course, they've you know, kind of abandoned their, Congress gave its power to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve describes itself as independent and private. It's not strictly true. That's more of a blurring of public versus private that I talked about. Companies get easy credit, interest, and loans from the Federal Reserve Bank, and they get insurance of their bank deposits through the FDIC. Um, now we're on subsidies so, of business. Sure. So, in, uh, basically, definition of subsidies is the government and taxpayers take a loss to prop businesses up that would basically go bankrupt otherwise. There's such a thing as direct subsidies. Um, governments all over the world gave nearly six trillion to fossil fuel companies in one year, as an example. Um, the Obamacare tax to compel purchase of health insurance is an arguable example of subsidies. I would even go so far as to argue that the IRS, their elected is responsibility. Again, it's handing over its responsibilities to some outside agency, this time the insurance companies. And we sort of kind of turned the health insurance agencies into a tax collection agency. It's kind of like part of the IRS in a way, um, in my opinion. 
So there's also corporate subsidies that come from the Department of Commerce, which used to be the Department of Labor and Commerce. See, I think they wanted the labor people out of their hair so they couldn't see that they were trying to get businesses all our money. Um, and there's state and local chambers of commerce. See, the problem with chambers of commerce is that business alliances can pose as a legitimate arm of government chambers of commerce, more of the blurring of the private versus public sector. So that could cause the taxpayers to support businesses that you don't want to support. Next slide. Bailouts and loans come from the Treasury Department. These are all I'm basically naming government agencies that do things that distort or substantially affect the market, cause us to spend money that we don't want to spend or um, manipulate money through inflation. Um, small business administration gives small business loans. PPP loans were forgiven by the S SBA. Next slide. Unnecessary taxes and trade agreements. Libertarian Party presidential candidate Gary Johnson said free trade doesn't need a treaty. That would be the basis for a libertarian opposition to NAFTA, even though it claims to support free trade. Really, it requires a certain percentages of vehicles or vehicle components be made in certain countries. And that could be decided just by solely market actors if we wanted. We wouldn't necessarily need a treaty. So Office of the U.S. Trade Representative and the Export-Import Bank, which is a government corporation, um, these things protect and promote trade, especially overseas. And that's the way they uh, support purchase of U.S. goods in foreign countries. See, as long as you're supporting domestic goods and foreign purchase of U.S. goods, the same amount, I guess. I don't know how you would calculate that, but it could be fair. But like, I would be the kind to say no subsidies, no trade supports from the government whatsoever. Uh, a third way, exclusive contracts and compelled purchase. This is basically referring to when government gives businesses or businesses which have unionized workforces, usually um, exclusive contracts to provide services, essentially government services to the citizens. And they do this, um, often these businesses are receiving subsidies, tax, uh, getting paying low tax rates, getting easy credit loans, receiving FDIC insurance. Next slide. So coercion and compulsion make purchase involuntary. Uh, you can't have free consensual market activity if your money is being directed by a government, a government that admits that its definition is a monopoly on legitimate violence. It legitimizes violence and it's violence to take our money and direct it towards a company we don't want to pay for. So we're taking away people's choices for no good reason. Um, Tap Harley Ag limits boycotts. And basically, what I'm arguing here is like it's not that the limitations on boycotts directly limit our ability to not buy something. Of course, being poor is what allows you to not buy all these things. But basically, I'm saying there's a free speech and expression and purchase chilling effect. There's a chilling effect upon free purchase because people are intimidated in a way into not talking about or at least not protesting about what goods and services they're not buying. Um, and I'll get to what the tap part of the ag does and how it limits boycotts later. But uh, basically my argument is that this does interfere with our market activity, including the freedom to not buy. Anymore. So government will be less afraid to write laws that direct taxpayer money towards us businesses if we're afraid to talk about the boycotts we're engaging in. And the fourth idea is if you have to hire a lobbyist to lobby for a change in the laws to stop your tax money from going to business you don't want to fund, you definitely don't live in a free market system. I want to talk about more about compelled purchase in a minute. I just want to note, and I'm going to cover this in more detail, uh, the ninth point. Private sector makes people buy things too. It's called company towns, company stores, debt slavery. And of course, there's non-businesses like organized crime, mobs, gangs, and thieves. But of course, organized crime sometimes poses a legitimate business or even poses as the police, like in Italy and Spain, they have that problem and they'll shake you down for your money. Um, so there's several different types of compelled purchase, direct, semi-direct, indirect. I guess the most direct way that our purchases are compelled would be through, through the social security system, which we have to use in order to work. And then people who receive social security money, um, we're kind of funding their purchases, we're subsidizing their purchases. So it's not fully direct, but it's the most direct way we have. Next slide. Semi-direct, the um, military protection, which we can't avoid. There's some people in California, maybe 20, 30 years ago, trying to make it legal to boycott income taxes so that we won't have to pay for the wars. I was a supporter of that as soon as I heard about it. 
you basically have to buy clothing. Um, there's a thing called vacancy laws, like Tennessee, for example, where if the police catch you with not enough money to buy a hotel in that town, you either have to leave town or you go to jail. So they've affected, they try to coerce you into buying a hotel for the night. Um, we'll get on slide. And like I said, Obamacare tax um, is kind of compelled purchase. You have to buy a driver's license, but only in order to drive a car on a public roadway. There was a lot of case law, it was 25 cases that used to rule that driver's license fees are unconstitutional because it's like the state charging you money to leave the state. It's like turning the state into a jail. A um, little bit, next slide. And the most indirect way of compelling purchase is just um, levying sales taxes on items that people could avoid buying and the sales taxes goes to benefit, to fund the government service. You can avoid toll roads uh, for the most part. You can avoid car insurance by not driving. Again, it's conditional. Maybe that could go in the semi-direct section, I don't know. And what I said again, processes, taxation, and subsidization. They make it indirect. Uh, businesses are taking our money and uh, every government service we buy, someone got an exclusive contract to provide that service, whether it's a business through privatization or union through nice workplace, uh, building a roads, for example. Um, Number four and five, monopolies and oligopolies. See, there's a uh, monopolies on legitimate violence. That's the definition of the state. Um, banking is a near monopoly. Government, is, uh, government service provision is a near monopoly. Well, government allows competition on some things. We used to not allow, I think it was by Sandra Spooner had to sue the government to have the right to have his own mail system in the 1870s. So they'll allow competition on some things, but it's near monopoly. Everything the government gets involved in and it's, Kind of the problem. You see, competition counteracts monopoly, but co cooperation does too. And that's where the left comes in. The left, left wing wants to engage in cooperative businesses and libertarians tend towards more capitalist ones. Um, but we need both of them to work together against monopolies. So like I said, oligopoly, uh, state of few sellers, a few buyers, people, uh, businesses that lobby for more privileges effectively get, they become near monopolies. They get more types of monopolies accumulated. They, they get a patent on something. They get, they get to dominate a, pro, a parcel of land exclusively. They kind of rack up monopolies and that's how they kind of become monopolies, become more or, or, oligopolistic or oligarchical if they come to rule the government. Next slide. So this has to do with corporate capture. I think we all understand that basic definition of corporate capture is when the government agencies come to be captured or controlled by the same bi by the business interests that those agencies are supposed to be regulated. Uh, Chomsky has talked about that. So businesses collude with government to keep new businesses from cutting in on their profits. Their profits, they say, but those are yet unearned. Next slide. And here's just a little diagram to illustrate what is a monopoly and all these things I'm talking about. The ideal situation for libertarians and free markers is a state of many sellers and many buyers. That's what's called a polyopoly, polyopsony, where you have as many people. It's, it's easy to enter the market, easy to start a business, low fees on businesses and, uh, you know, small businesses, at least. Whether you would have fees or high taxes on businesses that receive a lot of government favors and privileges and money, that's another uh, discussion, though. So basically, I'm here to say I oppose all subsidies. And um, businesses should only be able to do, quote unquote, whatever the hell they want, as long as they receive absolutely no taxpayer money. And I'm here to highlight all the ways that they are currently receiving taxpayer money. So I'm also here to say the libertarians say we have a free market. Well, what about all these things? Um, we don't, you know, I think they would agree in a lot of cases. I'm just trying to be more thorough. Next slide. Um, Benjamin Tucker's four monopolies are money, which I covered, land, I cover a lot, tariffs, which are taxes on the importation of foreign goods. Uh, there has to be a balance, um, or else you should have no tariffs at all, or else it leads to trade wars. Like I said, patents are a temporary monopoly. Governments are a monopoly. You don't get to avoid the police's protection. Uh, most of our microprocessors, um, this might be 10 or 15 year old information, but a while ago, I heard that Israel produces about 98% of the world's microprocessors. I know that Taiwan produces some too, but the point is that is a near monopoly. 
if you look at in terms of where countries coming from, of course, number of businesses is that's another issue. Um, not the best example, but there's a lot of food companies. There's a lot of foods that are made by just a small number of companies. Um, the number of media outlets and television stations went down a whole lot over the last 50 years. I don't know exactly how many. Under Bill Clinton, the number of large banks went down from 32 to 4. So media banks and foods are definitely near monopolies. So are eyeglasses. There's one company that makes almost 80, 90 percent of the eyeglasses. Only a small number of consulting firms. Um, and sometimes they get to handle government bailouts. Companies that receive bailouts they get to restructure them. Um, and airlines are monopolies. So are monopolies. And the agency responsible for overseeing antitrust lawsuits is the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division and the Federal Trade Commission. And presidents and gover uh, governors have some power too. So when presidents are derelict in their duty to provide antitrust, they should just do it more. But I think more importantly, we should create multiple antitrust agencies. Because, and this is a really random source for a political thought, but uh, former Beatle George Harrison commented when he was being taxed a lot, like 95% on his income, there's only one monopolies commission in the UK. Why would you expect a government monopoly to do something about business monopolies? My theory is that government monopolies help create and give privilege to business monopolies. They prop those things up. So, uh, sorry, uh, really blind. go to more. One more, please. Barriers of entry into the market and out of the market. This applies to unions too. It should be just as easy to go into a to join a union as it is to leave one. But I'm going to get to the market, this so called market of labor representation, representation of organized labor. Think of that as a market. It's kind of a libertarian way of thinking of things. But if we're going to give into that way of thinking and say privatize everything, let's say, what are we talking about? And let's be clear on our definitions. So um, barriers are created when new firms bear costs that are not borne by firms that are already in the industry. This is kind of the opposite of the free rider effect. And some examples of barriers to entry are permit fees, like driver's license fees, um, transaction costs, excessive fees to license business, uh, build a house, fish, hunt, or camp, and tariffs and other taxes that we could describe as unnecessary, like I would say sales taxes. It's just caused people to have to buy more of that product. It's a, number seven, privileges and immunities. Government grants uh, several types of insulation from legal and business competition is a takeaway from this whole talk, I guess. Um, they get uh, all these privileges from the Federal Reserve in terms of uh, borrowing money, but they also, in terms of uh, pharmaceutical companies, they get privileges from being sued. Um, and there's more types of government immunity from being sued every year, police and judicial immunity. Next slide. More, example, more examples of privileges and immunities. It counts on utilities. It's more of a financial privilege. Insulation from competition, basically business and government colluding to keep out new businesses so that old businesses can continue. Often this disrupts the flow of technological progress. Um, it, we didn't have, I mean, there's plenty of problems with um, Uber and Lyft uh, and, you know, like there's threats involved in, you know, having everyone 3D printing whatever the hell they want. But for the most part, these things exist because, you know, taxi cabs are too expensive and because there's this uh, lawsuit against John Deere where people are using non-approved parts to repair their tractors and suddenly uh, they're not allowed to sue John Deere anymore. For a misuse. So that's an example more of when private property is taken for public regulation, arguably unfairly, but I was supposed to cover that a little later. There's a thing called limited liability protections, limited liability corporations. So the state secretary of the state's offices grant the, they, they are responsible for incorporating businesses. So if the secretary of state's offices didn't exist, we couldn't incorporate any new businesses, or if the offices could just stop incorporating new businesses, we would stop basically insuring businesses with the taxpayer money. Next slide. And the eighth way to rig markets and corporate capture is the blurring of the distinction between private and public. This includes, so I'm going to talk about, I'm a private security guard, and in my training, I was told that I'm supposed to protect people, but I'm a private security guard. I thought I was supposed to protect private property. Turns out, no. 
And there's this thing called Warren versus DC, a Supreme Court decision where the police only have an obligation to protect and serve people who they have a prior existing contract with. And essentially the only people who are able to do that are people who can pay the police and who have private property to protect. So if the public police are protecting okay. private property and I'm a private security guard protecting the people, the public, that doesn't make sense. So that's a blurring of the private and public sectors. We need a clear definition between uh, public and private in a lot of ways. There's a sector that's not talked about that I'll get to in a minute. So another thing, next slide. People can be coerced into making purchases they wouldn't otherwise uh, make through a lot of different ways. It's taxation and subsidization. Um, Libertarians would say taxation is that more precisely is extortion and it's mass based. So it can be, can be consensual unless people can be convinced to support it. It's taking of public property for private use. Think about the word deprivation. It's deprivation when you take away someone's private property. That's what deprivation is. So there's a thing called inverse totalitarianism, which is when the businesses tell the government what to do. And then when the government takes private property, that's called eminent domain. So it's kind of two opposite things working there. Um, both ways that the sectors are blurred together. The government takes too much money from the people that blurs the free uh, free exchange of the market because most of our money is being spent uh, mostly against our will, most importantly before we actually receive it in our hands. Um, and it's just used to businesses, where's the difference between the markets and state economic activity. Next slide, please. So like I said, there's direct and indirect compelled purchase. Um, you could describe this as involuntary servitude because if we have to give someone else our money, we have to work in order to earn that money. So you could say this is a violation of Amendments 5 and 13 of the Constitution. Unfortunately, that is an argument that was used by the people who wanted the right to practice uh, segregation in public accommodations in Atlanta in 1964, leading to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So, um, but on the other hand, that wasn't a strictly private endeavor because those businesses were lobbying the governments to pass Jim Crow laws. Now, I don't mean to avoid the, uh, you know, avoid the issue of whether discrimination is wrong, it is wrong, but libertarians like to focus on, well, it's also bad for business. Should it be legal under some certain circumstances? Like what if black owned businesses got the right to segregate as well? I'm not trying to advocate that, but just trying to make people think outside of the box, you know, something that takes away white people's right to have property also can limit the right of Black people's right to, and Hispanics don't own property. So government messes with us all. Next slide. Uh, more examples of blurring the difference between private and public. Um, businesses can sue the government for lost profits that they never made or haven't earned yet. Future potential hypothetical profits that they haven't earned. This is because of the World Bank because it has sort of a court on settlement of investment disputes. Next slide. So here's a simplistic way of looking at things. It got cut off, but on the left, um, on the left we have public sector equals government. On the right, we have private sector equals businesses. That's an overly simplistic view of looking at the sectors. There's more sectors than just two. Next slide. Um, the pure public sector includes government agencies, um, international government agencies, and military alliances, and um, potentially includes. Uh, agencies that where the government and, and unions work together or government gives union majority power like we have now. And on the right, we have the private sector, uh, which is non-state private sector actors. Um, that's every, it's all businesses that don't receive government assistance. Sometimes they group together and it's called business alliances. Next slide. And there's something called the third sector, but there's two different kinds of it. There's one third sector where the government and businesses uh, work together to create an agency or the government sponsors enterprises. The government creates corporations, give corporate rights to businesses, and uh, businesses win bids to provide services to government. They're called government services, but are really privatized. Privatize the gains, socialize the losses model, where the taxpayers put the burden for any losses. Uh, limited liability corporations, public private partnerships. And these are all places where the government, the difference between public and private is blurred. Again, sorry, here, uh, next slide. 
the other type of third sector is the sector of the community and voluntary action, which is called the social third sector or the nonprofit sector. Every nonprofit, nonprofit firm, charities, uh, voluntary associations, credit unions, um, agencies where worker and consumer interests are aligned. The benefit of having direct negotiation between workers and consumers is that it gives an incentive to not have any upper management. The more direct that workers and consumers can negotiate prices, the more they're going to realize that each other has rights. And they're really the same thing. Everyone's a worker consumer. Everyone who works and buys is a worker consumer. So you have to align those interests to make it less likely that you'll have upper management or outside investment that could change the intentions of the firm. Um, egalitarian labor managed firms essentially cooperatives. Businesses with explicit social purposes. These are the non-standard, non-traditional businesses that are not just interested in profits. They're ones that are interested in community rights and having autonomous unions that can strike and boycott without government permission or the permission of even the union leaders. Next. Schools would be under the pure public sector, except for um, private schools. Yes, private schools, parochial schools, other. Um, I mean, it's arguable, like when, um, so the, what do you call it? The uh, system where people get money to choose a school of their choice. I can't think of it. Vouchers. Vouchers, yeah. That's, that, that you could describe as, I would say that's in the first kind of third sector because it's, I mean, I don't know. You, you couldn't describe a school as a business exactly, but I don't know, you could say it's part of the pure, uh, pure public sector, I guess. Uh, but so. So uh, the expanded view is there's a third sector on top that involves a lot of collusion between government and business. And there's another third sector on the bottom, which is really fourth sector, voluntary association. The objective of that is to avoid or not participate in the profit system, not participate in government to extend reasonably possible. So next slide, you superimpose a political spectrum on that that shows you why I chose those directions, public sector and government unions on the left, private sector uh, companies on the right, Third sector that takes our money on top, third sector of spending our money the way we don't want to please on the bottom. Uh, next slide. So does this look like a free market to you? Next slide. All these agencies that protect land claim using violence, uh, that insure businesses with our taxpayer money. It doesn't look like a free market to me. Uh, I already mentioned all these, so we don't have to go through them again. I'm just trying to basically overwhelm you with, look at all the agencies that we have. Next slide. Uh, then make it so we don't have a free market in policing or security or intelligence. Um, we have to pay and beg the government for the right to defend ourselves reasonably using uh, using firearms. And it's a barrier of entry because we should just be able to do it without paying the government, just like driving as long as you can obey the rational rules of the roads. And too many street signs, so it's overregulated. Driving's overregulated. Next slide. Yeah, not anti-street signs. I'm just saying we don't need so damn many of them. There's a study in the Netherlands that got rid of some street signs and it caused, uh, it resulted in less accidents because people were less distracted by all the street signs. Yeah, I, I support more roundabouts. So here's the final way that uh, markets can become rigged is a non governmental way. Um, when organized crime, mobs, mafia, gangs intimidate you, steal your money. Um, great. Uh, short story kind of written by Lysander Spooner about the highwaymen. The highwayman may take your money, but he won't pose as your legitimate representative and steal your money every day for two, 20 years later after that, next 20 years. So like I said, sometimes groups pose as police and take people's money. That's the time when the government, non-governmental agency takes your money, which rigs the market because you have less money to spend on legitimate goods. Any kind of theft, taxation, onerous taxation, unnecessary taxation. Red market activity, like things involving killing people for hire, uh, that's not part of our freedom. Um, commercial, commercial, commercial fraud and companies trying to capture entire communities, the results in people owing a lot of money to the same company, working for the same company, they owe out money to. Next slide, back to the Taft Harley Act. So I got 18 more slides, I'll try to be quick. Next slide, Lobby, oh, we're good. lobbying, corporate capture, and compelled purchase through subsidization. Sorry to get repetitive again. Um, so Taft Harley kind of indirectly limits our right to boycott because we're not allowed to loudly protest or we're buying in a way that 
is across multiple industries at the same time. Um, limitation upon the right to boycott, next slide please. Limiting our right to boycott across multiple industries is basically a limitation upon the right to have an effective boycott, a coordinated and organized boycott. Here's the takeaway from this. If we wanna have a general strike, I forgot to include it. If we wanna have a general strike, it's illegal. The way to make it legal is to repeal the Taft-Hartley Act. So can't have a general strike without mass arrests without repealing the Taft-Hartley Act first. That's essential to do that soon. Prohibitions on boycotts are nonsensical. There's no difference between not buying something and boycotting it and not being able to afford it. Um, there's all kinds of people who write articles about, here are the top industries that millennials are putting out of business. Like, you're just mad at us for being poor. You're mad at us because we can't afford your lame product. It's got lots of toxins in it or it's too expensive. So I wrote an article where millennials put 500 businesses or 500 types of goods and service providers out of business by choosing paper towels instead of paper towels and napkins, for example. There's all kinds of things we've been accused of boycotting because we can't afford it. It just doesn't make any sense. So there's no reason to limit our right to boycott. That's part of our kids' rights and it's part of workers' rights. So we have the, we should have the right to strike, full right to strike, or buy or not buy it, or form a union, leave the union freely without spending money. That, what about boycott address sanctions? We should talk about that in the uh, afterwards. Has to do with boycotting entire governments. That's what this is all kind of leading to. Is yeah. So next slide. Does the Tap Harley Act do anything good? Um, it used to prohibit unions from donating to federal election campaigns. It uh, was repealed. It used to prohibit government employers from engaging in strikes. That was also repealed. Um, prohibits political strikes intended to pressure government to change policies. Uh, I think it's if it's for constitutionally supported ends, I think that would be legitimate to have political strikes. But the the worry that libertarians have about you know emboldening unions or giving them more rights or privileges would be that they could potentially lobby for more industries and types of goods and service providers to become part of government services. And we believe that what the libertarians believe, excuse me, I'm a left libertarian, um, really anarchist, thing that. Uh, Things are going to get more expensive the more we have um, unionized workers providing government services, not because they're unionized workers, but because the government's helping them, uh, giving them the monopoly, giving them the contractual monopoly, exclusive monopoly. So I would like to depoliticize labor as much as possible. I don't want to take away rights of unionized workers to protest, um, but we do. Need to, we do need to have an open talk about whether people are basically just lobbying, whether unionized protesters are lobbying for growing the government. When what they want would grow the government, libertarians would be against it, um, unless it actually supports our freedoms. Um, a couple of the things Taft Harley does that's good, we could repeal Taft Harley and then pass those things, or we could just repeal parts of Taft Harley and different ways to do it. How white libertarians feel about unions. Uh, we support concerted activity for private sector workers. Uh, the worker, workplaces should avoid the need for unions by aligning people with profits so that people don't think they want or need a union because they're being paid enough, treated right, uh, good benefits. Public sector unions, according to, according to libertarians, should be weak and or limited, like I said, so the government doesn't go unlimited. Next slide. So there's this piece of legislation called the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. The Taft-Harley Act amends this. And that law provided for majority unionism and compulsory unionism. What that means is that unions, quote unquote, must represent all workers in each bargaining union, or unit or workplace, which is essentially the same thing. But in the Janus decision a couple of years ago, uh, um, it was asked, but, but do they actually provide do they actually represent all workers just because they have a majority, just because there's this thing obligating them to protect and work in the interest of all people. So the pro-union people would say that's a free rider problem and uh, people who don't want to pay dues or join the union are taking advantage of it. But according to libertarians, that would be not union's fault. There was a guy named Mike Sinto, Mike Sinto, who had a radio show in Ohio in the 80s. And Reed Larson of the Right to Work Committee um, got on the phone with AFL leader Wes Wells, and uh, Larson said that he doesn't want workers to free ride either. So basically, the, the thing to take away from this is the, the Wagner Act creates the problem by creating the free riders. It obligates unions to provide what they would consider benefits to people who don't want to be part of the union. 
they're not part of the union because they don't think that what the union is doing is benefiting them. So both sides don't want this free rider problem to exist. Next slide, please. There's three different ways to address the so-called free rider problem in a way that works for both sides. You have what's called members only collective bargaining, dual unionism and minority unionism. That's having two or three or more unions in the same workplace. People can leave and join unions freely. They have multiple choices. Japan has this, uh, it's called an MONMU, members only non-majority unions. So we would have to repeal the majority union section of the Wagner Act in order to have this. Uh, there's also a decision in 1977 where um, unions could collect dues only as necessary to cover expenses of collective bargaining, contract administration. So basically you would let workers have, individual workers have a little bit more decision over under what conditions they pay union dues. Or you could just say, well, if you're in the same, um, yeah, there, there's there's different there's different things that you need to bargain for that you, you could have some things paid by paid for by everyone and some things be voluntary. That'd be another way to resolve this problem. Next slide. So, amending that part of the Wagner Act, getting rid of monopoly unionism, uh, libertarians could support this because it'd be easier to leave a union. Um, and there'll be more unions, more choices. We love market choices. And libertarian leftists should support this because there'd be more unions. We like unions, so why shouldn't there be more of them? Of course, they'd be smaller. That's the problem. Uh, but it'd be easier to form and join them. Next slide. And the effect of appealing. Um, there we go. So the effect upon union employer relations and how we think about them. We would have to face the fact that unions are private sector entities. And governments can even be defined as corporations for financial purposes. Political parties are private too. They're corporations. Republican and Democratic Party are corporations. They can change their own rules in the middle of the election. They're not public sector entities. So in a way, they're private sector. It's like a lot of the things we think are government are actually private. Next slide. And according to the Cornell Law Dictionary, um, federal corporate, federal government, excuse me. Union, United States is defined as a federal corporation. Um, and some of the Eastern states began as corporations. They're called corporations, as far as I'm aware, um, made up of landowners who lived nearby each other and wanted to protect each other's property. So, next slide. The effect that repealing TAP hardly and changing that majority union section would have on union employer relations. Um, we got already, okay, we're on the bottom half of this. So what this means is that a private sector union contracts with a private sector employer. So it's all private sector activity. And that would imply that labor contracts are voluntarily agreed to, uh, not fully ready to endorse that idea. Of course, there's natural pressures like poverty that change people, like I said, that break the market, that make people work for businesses they don't really want to. But this would make us kind of question, are those contracts legally enforceable? Um, because unions would have more power. Um, it is like small unions, really. Small unions would have the right to come into existence and challenging the union that holds the existing monopoly because it got the majority of votes. So basically what I'm saying is this right of unions to have a majority over representation of workers, it's kind of like a monopoly. It crowds out smaller competitors, smaller, small unions that might come into existence and compete against it. Next slide. Got seven more slides. Thanks for hanging in with me. Um, to wrap it up soon. Sure. Now. Like I said, I'm, uh, yeah, kind of getting into some territory I already talked about. So Oops. this exclusive contract yeah. distorts the market. Next slide. Start with all these formatting issues. So the bad thing that Taft Har the repealing right to work laws and Taft Harley Act would do, according to libertarians, is this would make right to work laws illegal. And does that violate the 10th amendment? Because Congress never had the right to regulate labor. So it should be up to each state, whether we're gonna ban certain types of union security agreements, you would think. Next slide. But the pros would also be that uh, right to work laws are special at legislation which shouldn't be necessary. They prohibit contractual agreements that are perfectly voluntary and occur within the private sector, as I said. Therefore, states shouldn't pass such laws prohibiting union shop or closed shop union security agreements because they're voluntary contracts and government's not supposed to interfere with the obligation of contracts. And Friedrich Hayek actually supported right to work laws, but he admitted that they aren't necessary. So it's not a real endorsement. He said there ought to be no need for special right to work laws. Next slide, please. Um, this, he says a situation created in the US by legislation 
may make special legislation practicable. I mean, it doesn't mean it was necessary in the first place. So the situation, the legal situation he's talking about is Wagner Act, which is what I was talking about, that obligates employers to bargain with unions. So I'm gonna to get to that, back to that in a minute. Next slide, please. Who supports repealing the Taft Harley Act? Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. I'm um, gonna skip that so we can keep moving forward. So Frieder Tayek, like I said, uh, you could describe right to work as a special legislation that grants special privileges to unions. Um, so the only reason to support right to work laws, be it admitted by Hayek, is uh, to fix a problem that was already created by the government in the past. So that's the reason why libertarians, free marketers who listen to Hayek could be uh, against um, right to work laws. But should they support retaining the obligation to negotiate with labor? Um, this would uh, ostensibly violate the non-aggression principle because you use government force to, to make people negotiate with each other, especially on an employer's private property. Right. Libertarian capitalists wouldn't support that. But if you think about it, negotiation, um, if violence is prohibited, then nonviolent negotiation is the only other option. So compelling nonviolent negotiation is all that's happening here, is if you think about it that way. Peaceful discourse is not compelled negotiation. So if you don't compel negotiation, it could increase strikes. So those are two different ways of looking at it. And again, the government argues that strikes are coercive. So you can read my blog, aquarianagrarian.blogspot.com. Find my books on the May 2017 article. Um, again, I'm running for State House. Thanks for listening to such a long presentation. Okay. You're ready to take questions? Uh, you're ready to take questions now? Yeah. All right. Who's got questions? All right. Loud, Ernie, okay. Loud. Ernie, so they can. Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hey, uh, Tim. Tim, don't yeah. be spinning your camera too much, boy. Charlie, I'm going to bring it. Uh, you can, uh, you're not in control. I'm trying to. Hey, thanks, Tizzy. Please just leave it on the podium. I'm going to leave get... it on the podium. Ernie, go ahead. Um, in, so in terms of your campaign, mm -hmm. to what extent are you attempting to integrate these blocks? By the way, I think for your Thank a you. lot of material. Please repeat the question. Sure, I will. Sure. The question is, do I intend to integrate this into my campaign? Since I'm not running for U.S. Senate, I can't do anything directly about the Taft Harley Act or Wagner Act. But I'm running for state house, so um, I do support um, repealing sales taxes. Uh, and re replacing them with the tax on the hoarding of land, disuse, misuse of land, uh, allowing land to fall into disrepair. It's a way to kind of overturn property taxes. Um, I don't support taxes on the value of property, but on the disuse and hoarding and waste of property. What about income tax? I, I support abolishing income tax. I'm sorry. Repealing and abolishing the income tax. Okay, but, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead. Yeah, would you please not spin the camera around? It's a bit Charlie, just Charlie we're going to do. I've been doing it for years, so. We're no, gonna... I don't want. To, I'm just telling you, please do not keep spinning it around. Do we have one? To argue? Well, yeah, kindly stop spinning. Charlie, it around. we're going to do it my way here with the camera. You can leave if you don't and like. You know, you, your these presentations are a mess. Your way. You can put people on camera. I'm fine. All I got right. A complete mess. Charlie, the question. Get your, Charlie, your question. What's your question, Charlie? I got a question. Number one, I got two questions. Sure. Is the right to have a union represent me at my place of employment, is it a right or a special privilege? And number it's, two, sure. if the employees vote, and a majority vote to have a union, how is it you allow a person not to go along with a democratic decision? They can veto the decision, say, I don't care how the vote was taken, I'm not joining the union. So they have veto power regardless. So I don't care if you had an election, I have veto power. Where yeah. else in democracy is a vote taken, let's say even in the libertarian organization, right. is a vote taken 
and the members can say, well, I just don't like that vote. Sure. And you they can disregard it. Is that the way your organization me, works? Sure. You asked me the same question a couple of years ago, but in a more like broad general context, not just having to do with labor. So having a union represent you is part of your rights, but it becomes a special privilege when government confers onto the union that, got, that gets a majority of votes to represent everyone. And people who don't want to be in the union say it's not effectively representing my interests. And the union says it, uh, we do represent each worker's interests because we're obligated to. Well, just because you're obligated to by government doesn't mean you actually do it. And are the workers satisfied? And then um, so people would get the right to not abide with the majority union vote only if they are in a workplace where there's a contract where the majority doesn't have a right to uh, dominate that workplace and crowd out other things that other people that want to start unions. So um, since we have the Taft Harley Act, it would be would be required to abide by the majority uh, decision. But I'm advocating for repealing, excuse me, the Wagner Act. I'm advocating repealing the Wagner Act to allow multiple unions to exist in the same workplace. And that's how people could avoid a majority decision because it wouldn't affect them. Okay. Um, wait, wait a minute, I don't fully understand this. Harley, if a vote is taken, and the majority want to have a union there, can an employee individually say, I don't care how you voted, I'm not joining the union. If and you're saying that's okay? If he Where else does that happen? By the vote before the vote, if he promised to abide by the vote before he vote before the vote and he participated in the vote, then he has to abide by that. But if a person works in a workplace where he's not required to join a union for some reason, whether they're a private contractor, or if it's a situation where there wouldn't be that majority unionism requirement, uh, where multiple unions can exist in the same workplace, that's the only way a person would be legally allowed. Not now, but you'd have to repeal the Wagner Act. It's the only way someone would be allowed to not participate in the decision of a union that holds a majority of workers, because there'd be other unions that that person could join. All right, Janice, we'll get to you next. Uh, who's uh, uh, thank the, you in the back right? Okay. I, I know we're gonna we're gonna get you next and then you Luke. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I there was a lot in this presentation that I just did not understand, but yes, this is what yes, I, I, my on. question is. Uh, um, I want a list of maybe three things I could write to Durbin and Duckworth to ask for the repeal of the uh, uh, Taft Hartley Act. Yeah. Um, so you, you want to help making points why it should be done? I would say because the, yeah. the limits are right to boycott unfairly. Um, yeah. And, and it, so that's what's, yeah, you mentioned that in the talk. And what? the Taft Hartley yeah. limits the right to unionize. Unionize? Is that what it, it is? Limits the right to boycott in multiple union, multiple industries to at the same time. So to coordinate boycotts across multiple industries. That's not it. That's not legal because of the trap that far. So we need to basically, in order to make a general strike legal, the Taft Harley Act has to be repealed first, or at least substantial portions of it. We can keep some. Just call on them. I'm going to be a general strike. Is that yeah. What you're trying to get to yeah. Okay. All right. What is your definition of when you So that's to... one thing. Oh, oh, Janice, we're. Oh, I'm we're sorry. Doing next one. one sec, Russell. So, she, so she's saying I only named one thing. Other things, um, I mean, you you can look into the types of uh, solidarity actions that Taft hardly prohibits. You can find three examples of them. Um, okay. Presentation of at the moment, but uh, just basically, it's 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 the right for people to coordinate with boycotts and strikes across uh, industries. Um, it just it interferes with the natural right to protest, and it interferes with our right to demand that our money doesn't go to businesses that we don't support. And uh, it's, it's helpful for resisting, um, you know, when yeah. Are, are you know, Starbucks right. fires Janice, people, people who Janice, unionized, Janice, who tried to unionize, and that sorry, was never brought to a court case or anything. Could you could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks. There's been a big effort to unionize Starbucks workers. Yeah. And um, what Starbucks came back and said is they fired the workers who organized the uni unionization. Right. 
That's called retaliation, and that is illegal because of uh, two executive orders by Obama and Lyndon Johnson. And uh, if more people knew about that, uh, I think it'd be less common that people get fired for retaliation, people for through retaliation. Yeah. Under the I, 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 so the workers would have to bring a lawsuit. All right, Janice, if we got to move on. I know it was controversial, guys. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you're referring to some people owning property accordingly. I'm referring to the people who are actually doing the most hoarding in land, for example, uh, as, as, as hoarding. I don't say all property ownership is hoarding, but on some level it is a uh, monopoly and it's, it's, it's exclusive use of property, which is monopoly. You have monopoly. No, it's or, not. If, it's pro if you have something like that, then you have no private property. Why is that? It's no different than what they did in Connecticut when they seized that land in a domain to go to a developer and it collapsed and it's now vacant. Mm -hmm. And all that women's domain was allowing some corporation to pay off some of your politicians to give them the freebie. Yeah, I think that, that's that's a valid point. You're concerned about government taking private property. Um, this doesn't have so much to do with the Taft Harley thing, but in terms of my support of Henry George, um, I would support local governments seizing unoccupied or wasted lands, lands that are blighted, but there that would be limited. I, of course, wouldn't want them to just immediately hand those things over to businesses or corporations because that would defeat free market principles. There's an idea of geo-libertarianism that integrates, you know, key free markets, but still have, you know, working local governments and environmental regulations that are um, as decentralized as possible. So um, I don't want to take any land that's not being wasted. I only want I only want local governments as possible, as local governments as possible. Yeah, but who we'll gets to determine waste and blighted has been used so uh, so government can uh, so, uh, easily take a tenement domain and give it to their corporate overlords. Sure, that's a valid concern. I, I wouldn't want to take anyone's private property who actually earned it and is working to defend it and develop on it. So, so. And what is earned it? Who gets to determine? Yeah, those it's debatable. I, I would leave it up to each local government. Uh oh. Private a, those property is private. Sure. And if I own but, the but land, check this I out. can do. I mean, I maybe can't. You can't pollute it, but. It is my land. Right, but let me ask you this. If the police come and protect your land, isn't that the state helping you exercise your property claim? And isn't that no longer private because it's the public state helping you exercise your property claim? There's well, lots the of ways state, to limit private property. The state is not helping us. The state do, do, does what it damn well pleases. Yeah, it shouldn't. We shouldn't have a state because it's violent and monopolistic. It creates monopolies, in my opinion. Well, I think we should repeal the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay, I, I think, uh, you know, like I said, we need more, we need, we either need more antitrust agencies, like we need more agencies looking out after monopolies, because if we need the government to do it, it's a monopoly, and it shouldn't be the only agency authorized to do something about antitrust. We have to all work together as consumers, as uh, entrepreneurs, as workers, to demand that we have this polyopsy, polyopoly, a state of many sellers and many buyers, so that everyone can easily challenge Monopolists through competition and cooperation. I want to get to you in the back here. I think I'm up to a lot. There used to be a Bell Labs. The Bell Labs, the government sold it up. And then there were these baby Bells. Well, ultimately, they all either collapsed or were together and sold off. And then the government took them all and sold them to the government. I think there there are, but uh, it would be. I think the set of businesses that would wield those natural oligopolies would be radically different if we didn't have so much of awarding government uh, government awarding privileges and immunities and all these other things to businesses. Uh, but that's that's a really deep and profound question. So we should definitely discuss it in person. Uh, I'm not really an expert in antitrust, but yeah. Definitely bring that up again if you or, or clarify your question. Anything I didn't address. Okay. Sorry. All right, Jake, you're next. Jake. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead, Jake. Jake, we can hear you. You just muted, Jake. 
All right, there, there you Hello? go. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Did, did I did I hear did I hear you right? You're opposed you're opposed to people who own cars uh, to have. Uh, you're you're opposed to um, people who drive uh, having driver's license. I don't understand no, that one. I think people should get driver's licenses if they want. I just think states shouldn't obligate people to pay driver's licenses fees in order to get a driver's license. And if you think about it, basically that, that would leave room open for the government to just uh, okay, you go to pass the test, they give you a license, and you don't pay for it. If you don't pay for it, then it's not arguably it's not the state charging you money to leave the state in an efficient way. Um, well, what's wrong? What's wrong with charging you for it? it it's, it's the state turning itself into a prison and saying that you have to pay the state money in order to leave it. Well, what's wrong with that? The, 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 most, of the, most of the money, for, my understanding, most of the money from the, most of the money you pay for a driver's license or for, say, like like a uh, city sticker or, or, or uh, um, uh, license plates goes, 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 back to, goes back to help uh, run, uh, run the roads and run the Secretary of State's office. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with that. If people want to get a license, uh, if people want to pay for it. But I'm proposing, you know, you could get a license without having to pay for it. There's nothing that would stop that as long as government figures out a way to operate that service for free or through voluntary donations or something. Oh, that's we silly. Also private, we also have private ways to get driver's licenses. In Illinois, the Secretary of State and the DMV are different things. Um, I don't have a very you know, solid understanding of this. This It has to do with the blurring of the private and public sector. The state has licensed out the right to give people the, the right to uh, issue driver's licenses. Uh, something we could do that's a totally free market activity as long as the government doesn't give our money to these insurance agencies is if we had insurance agencies and underwriting companies figure out how to oh. for a person to drive and they can well, that, that, other person's that, that, that's a that's a safety issue. You have to have you have to have insurance in order to drive. That's a safety issue. Right, but is you know are these driver's licenses an interference in interstate commerce? You can't freely move the state without paying money. It's it's arguably that, um, and it's kind of a you, pay, you pay you pay you pay it to your home, you pay the money to your home state. Yeah, so that obligates you to work. That's slavery. Involuntary service. Oh, I see. You, oh, oh, I see. You, you, I see. So, well, well, what if you're not working and you get it for free? Yeah, if you got a driver's license for free, that's a way to avoid or bypass this problem. But uh, again, just to know why I'm talking about this, there are about 25 different lawsuits in the 20th century um, where the government ruled it is unconstitutional to charge fees as a privilege to leave the state. That's the implication of uh, the Ninth Amendment case law on that issue. Thanks for the question. Luke, I think it's unconstitutional to pay, have to pay the state for a driver's license. It used to be considered that uh, way, but it's not considered that way anymore. Um, you can ask another question in a moment if you want. Luke? All right, all right. Let's get to uh, Brian Loke. Yeah, a very simple question. I really don't have to say Thank very It was in retaliation to a large wave of strikes from 1945 to 1946, and it also amended the portion of the Wagner Act um, that prohibited employers from interfering with concerted activity. It's still, it's still in that probably still exists, yeah. yeah. So um, I think you also said that the, the labor was not just that the unions that increased. Other than that, I think that's all. I would think it's it decreased. I, I know it's been increasing recently. Yeah, um, I, know I didn't cover that. I I yeah, it definitely decreased from the late 50s to the 2010s, but it started the final increasing. Question, uh, George, uh, George, yeah. Uh, yes, I'm in favor of that. It's a tax on uh, tax on non-use, tax on misuse, abuse, and non-use of land. A tax on non-development. Uh, the idea is tax land, not man, uh, but it's not taxing land value. It's not taxing property value. It's taxing the value lost when a person um, pollutes a property or gets minerals out of the ground or, in some cases, exclusively uses a property and it's a large wow. amount of property. So 
hoarding and pollution and, and allowing uh, property to fall in the blight, those would all be heavily taxed, but um, arguably it's not a tax, it's just a fee. Um, yeah. So, okay, uh, Charlie, you want to make a second question? I thought I oh, I'm sorry, have, no. We have others back here. All right, yeah, yeah. Uh, go uh, on. All right, go, go ahead. Uh, here we go, round and round. Uh, you know, what I, 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 what I,
get rid of all the money, get back, start money. What, what's going on? You're probably more concerned than that I am because the problem, all the money going to um, I can't say I know what people were trying to do about it aside from Warren and Sanders trying to repeal the Tap Art Act, although that was about 10 years ago at this point. But um, so I guess what I want to say is uh, if you read Ron Paul's book, Liberty Defined, he explains why uh, money in politics is the cause of out of control government and out of control, you know, the removal of limits on, uh, on what the government can do. It's not like He's saying that money in politics is a symptom of government largesse, not the other way around. So I actually don't think that, uh, not that Citizens United is great, it's just that repealing it is not really necessary. It does some good, it does some bad. See, Citizens United makes it illegal to broadcast. I looked up the Wagner Act, and it's also called the bill that brought us the National Labor Relations Board. Yes. Not only Five members. was if we if, if people were actually aware of worker workers rights how would different types of media like newspaper television or radio be different um, I think you would have 
less viewership and less crowd, people put less credibility in things like CNN and MSNBC and the, like the fake left. Uh, they're really after <laughs> government and collusion with business a lot. Like there's people in the MSNBC <laughs> administration. So they're, they're the fake left and you have to read things like um, The Economist magazine to get Jimmy Moore left and that, Mother Jones, um, Jimmy Dore. So, you know, like Democratic and Republican dominated media, really they'll do whatever it takes to avoid referring to the language of Marxism, dialectical materialism. They'll do whatever it takes to avoid implying that Palestine is supposed to be, it's a people that's supposed to be free and Palestine exists. Um, they, they do what Chomsky does. They distort words and language and Obama distorted language and meaning things. The US code and the Black's Law Dictionary distorts the meaning things. So. Uh, we need to have more sit-ins and talk-ins about like, what all these words mean and you know understand that all these words are being mentioned in politics and the media they have specific legal definitions and if we knew the meaning of a lot of that it would really frighten us in terms of what our okay. rights are and what how we're considered by the government all right charlie make uh, uh jonathan jonathan we got we jonathan we got it we're, we're got to get charlie make it quick you're the last question we got to go to rebuttals uh, Joe, you, uh, at the beginning, you maintain there is no free market and there's, you had many slides of claiming their land monopoly. Mm. I lived on a dairy farm in Kansas for a number of years and we bought and sold land and rented land every day of the week. Yeah. And, and there's no free market. If you wanted to have pigs and cattle and chicken. You could do so if you wanted. Nobody came by, and there was no inspector. Mm. So I don't understand how there's no free market. We could do whatever we wanted with our farm operation completely. Sure, but there were a few interests. So I don't understand how there's no free market, and there's no and land monopoly. I There was no evidence whatsoever. Sure. So, so you're saying that uh, the, the, the presence of a food inspector, a health inspector, says it would, it would imply that we, what are you saying? That Nobody we, came along and yes. asked us what we were doing that with that operation. Market. Well, there were cases uh, 10, 15 years ago where um, a woman tried to do a bake sale to fund her local school and the local health department cracked down on her. Through all the things that, that selling food, and we were not selling food. No one could eat it because it was accepted by the health department. So sometimes the government is selling and pure food, food and drugs. Right? So, go ahead. Uh, we're, we're done with questions. All right, we're going on. Why on. did no one Charlie, inspect our operations? We're going to rebuttals now. Question period is over. It's now 7-12. We only got about 20 minutes. All right, I'm going to allow everybody about three minutes. Charlie, if you want to go first on the rebuttals, go ahead. All right, then, Mike, you're going to, Mike? Yeah. All right, you got three minutes, Mike. Three? Three, because we're half. It's an abbreviated time tonight because of uh, some extensive questions. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thanks for the presentation. A little heavy on the verbiage. When I do PowerPoints, it's only pictures, graphs, and charts. But, uh, you know, so, you know, it keeps people more, more interested. Otherwise, it was a lot of good information. Uh, the reason there's taxes on everything, and everybody looks at it as like control, is that there are certain people that like don't have real estate. So they don't pay taxes because they don't have real estate. And there's people that don't drive like me. So there's, I don't pay any, I don't pay for these roads for the last six years because I'm not paying for gasoline. So they have these taxes on just about everything just to kind of even things out so that everybody's chipping in. Uh, we got to pay for the, the War Department. That caught, Half your taxes go to the War Department so that we could fund MIC and, you know, wars that we like to get involved in. Because America loves wars. And potential wars. And, yeah, it's just, you know, a lot of money making in there. But I still think that the biggest, one of the biggest problems is kickbacks, dark money, K Street, 
Washington, centralized Washington, CC, all the creepers in the CC. And it's big business, corporations, you know, crooked politicians. You know, I think half these politicians or most of these politicians just say stuff because the corporations want them to say stuff. So, um, yeah, just we got to get, everybody knows we got to get all this money out of, uh, you know, away from the uh, politicians. It's just America's turning too corrupt. Thank you. All right, next. Next. Who's next on the rebuttals? Yeah, just go up there because it's a little easy. All right. Go ahead, Jonathan. All right. Go ahead, Jonathan. Three minutes. Three minutes and counting. My goodness. Uh, thank you, Joe, for an excellent presentation. Uh, Citizens United Supreme Court decision is basically uh, declaring that we live in a world where uh, personhood status is designated for corporations uh, and right to work for less laws are declaring that in our society that uh, there's thinghood status designated for people. So I repeat that. In my interpretation of the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, uh, it's basically saying we're a society and where personhood status has been designated for non-living entities and right to work for less laws and things that go in line with promoting uh, that direction for all of us to live more in a society based on that uh, worldview is basically declaring that we have thinghood status for people who actually do have living uh, qualities that make us definitively uh, earthlings, carbon based life forms, humans. Uh, it's basically giving us unnecessary hood status that we live in this world where. Uh, we have every right possible to be in debt, but we have no right possible to be aware of our power from our work. Uh, this goes to the heart of uh, the labor movement's uh, demand, which is, uh, yes, be distrustful of the government. Uh, they are the judge who rules that we have a lack of awareness of labor rights. Yes, voice dissent and opposition and disagreement with the government. But who's the person who does the most uh, uh, just as absolutely despicable work on behalf of the government? And it's still, it's the government directing it. So it's still the corruption in government that exists. Uh, the media. The media not only tells us that we're not going to tell you about your worker rights and what gives you the greatest power as a collective, they're going to censor your ability to know that you're being brainwashed by the rights to buy yourself into debt. So be aware of that. Every broadcast you watch those commercials, they are not a freedom. They are a chance to have more appealing chains on your economic life. Thank you, Joe, to reintroducing us to a language that most of us never hear and know about, but it's right there at the center of our power, worker rights awareness. Excellent talk. I can't wait to hear your next talk. Okay. All right, three minutes. Okay. Uh, yes, hi, uh, I'm Ellen Corley, and I uh, always appreciate the Free Speech Forum. Uh, thank you, Joe, uh, that was good. Um, you know, my uh, my concerns are a lot like Jonathan's in that I think of, you know, it as a, um, I guess this is a natural rights way of thinking, but it, the more, the critical thing is that we have been, we are being miseducated by the media monopoly. And, um, and I don't think there's a union or, you know, uh, anything that has anything to do with that. Um, and so that's, you know, right now, they, I guess the argument with, there's, there's hardly any unions left, you know, by design. You know, the, um, I was writing tonight, 
I do for headline. What we have is a failure to communicate by design, by the design of the, the intelligence agencies, CIA and the Mossad are the same thing now that are behind the, the censorship and of our, our total, total uh, media, our knowledge system, our information system, our, our communication systems have been just reduced down to a, um, you know, just one, it's like it's, it's being pushed. It's artificial intelligence being pushed at us that um, designed to make us into indoctrinated minds as the name of a, a new book is. Um, you know, they, they actually did a study uh, regarding the effect of the, um, the injections uh, that reduced um, the hippocampus, our curiosity. So, you know, I had learned this as an aspiring copywriter. Um, Ogilvy and Mather said, you know, if you want to be a copywriter, you you have to have your your head full of a lot of, you know, you immerse yourself in all the the ideas of the category and everything so that you can think creatively about it and come up with a good headline. You know, if we if there's nothing inside there, it's which is kind of where we are now. Um, I, you know, they. Really, there is a total government monopoly. That's the problem. They don't like that word, and so that's why we should use it or make sure that when we're, you know, deciding, we have to, when we're deciding what to do. See, they say there's no conspiracy <laughs> theories, or you know, they use that word. The CIA came up with it to reduce, you know, to discredit very valid theories like, you know, the origin of the pandemic. And um, the, what the theory that we need to be operating on, which is statistics, which I could, I know about, is decision theory. We, the, the thing is, the government has to make right decisions based on established okay. laws and um, congressional Wrap decisions that came about through through uh, consensus, but have been wiped out ever since the 1948 National Security Act, basically put the intelligence agencies by executive action in charge of everything. Thank you, Robin. Charlie, do you want to speak or not? Yeah, I will. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. You covered a lot of territory. I'm going to go about in four areas. First of all, when the there was something about granting monopolies. When the U.S. government affords drilling rights, they there is something there that there's big corporations and little corporations. Both are can advantage of drilling rights, for example. There is no distinction between big companies and little companies. So all that thing about the government granting monopolies is false. There's no differentiation in legislation, uh, enabling legislation like that. So the government does not grant monopolies. Also, number one, you have to keep in mind there's a difference between employment law, such as wages and benefits, and labor law. Labor law is what we heard tonight. So that's the relationship between uh, management and unions, They're how they interact. Number one, I heard a number of things he talked about that the government awards exclusive contracts. For 40 years, I represented the contracting officers of the government. I have no idea what he's talking about. Once in a while, there may be sole source for getting something that was extremely rare, but there is no such thing as an exclusive award contracts. This is something that you made up. Also, there's no such thing as natural law. That's something that philosophers kind of discuss, but we are dealing in a real world in which we're dealing with the law, government, the laws of government. So keep a differentiation there. Now, most importantly, I've heard them over and over again, repeatedly, claim that there were instances of state violence. There is state violence in totalitarian governments. I have no evidence of state violence in the United States. We do arrest criminals and so forth, but this is, if you lose a decision in court, this is a libertarian nonsense. 
had no time in the government. I worked for 40 some years. Did I ever engage in state violence? We made decisions against private sector, but it was not a total. And you've got, if you want my respect, stop trying to convey that nonsense that you're so oppressed and, and that it's ridiculous. And I don't think it even should be permitted. It takes away from the fact that there are governments that in fact throw people in camps and torture them and so forth. Get realistic, libertarians. Now, last of all, I'd like to know if the libertarians have ever introduced legislation that benefit the people. If they're not, they don't know. They just kind of complain about the way things, oh my. And we've heard there's no free market. There is, in fact, I showed I'm in sorry. my farming I'm operation sorry. that there is, in fact, anybody can go into farming if they've got them. The only problem restriction on a free market is getting capital. Businesses are underfunded. That's over and over said again that they're undercapitalized and, and everybody Charlie, and their brother knows it. Thank you. All right. Wrap it up. All right. Sid Cohen's next. Sid, we're going to just stay right there. Oh, okay. Speak loudly. I'll get the uh, okay. they're just going to hand I'm going to hand you the computer, now, Mike. When I was a kid, that was before the war, you saw Small businesses, like for instance, clothing stores, small um, fruit and vegetable stores, everything was small. Now, <clears throat> if you want to go to a drugstore, you have to go to Monopoly drugstore. If you want to get clothing, you have to go to places like Marshall Field used to be, or the other uh, stores downtown, they were all very big. And if you look around the neighborhoods, you won't find hardly any small stores. What happened was, you had a store, let's say a shoe store, and another shoe store opened three or four blocks away. So the first shoe store, what he done, he went to the bank and borrowed money. And what he done, he undersold the other shoe store. So people would go, would go there. And then he done the same thing as far as other shoe stores are, are, are concerned. And after a while, he went to the bank and the bank said, well, you cannot borrow more money unless you're sitting on your board of directors. So the banks came into it. And it, you became a financial situation where the banks controlled almost everything. And that's what happened now. The banks control almost everything. And when you have a big... Uh, Monopoly, you need raw materials, you need markets, you need cheap labor. So what did they do? They went overseas to get that. And that's called imperialism. Imperialism, what happens is you got workers there, let's say in Mexico, you know how much auto workers make in Mexico? No, one twentieth of what they make in the United States. So in other words, they make super profits. And that's called imperialism. And that's what we have in the United States. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Sid. All right. Uh, you want to go ahead, Ernie? Go ahead. I guess, I guess so. Three minutes, Nobody Ernie. Else seems to be fighting. Nobody else seems to be fighting for the lecture now. Uh, Joe, Go ahead. thank you again for a good talk. I'm looking forward to seeing your slide uh, so I can absorb some of what you what you threw at us there very, fairly quickly through the evening. And I agree with a, a lot of what you said. You made some very good points. I like the way you attempted to uh, uh, show how the Greens and the uh, Libertarians actually have some things in common. Most people think they're kind of a the opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, 
And I agree with you that there's too much power in national companies and we should attempt to distribute. I think that's what we're trying to say, distribute this power and this money between a lot more people and a lot more smaller organizations and, and uh, smaller companies, uh, possibly by requiring national companies to franchise and uh, a certain percentage of the ownership, let's say a McDonald's or even a Target or whatever, has to be somewhat uh, local. Um, and I like the way you wanted to encourage the small businesses in a variety of ways. I think it, and I agree with Sid, things in some ways were better when we had a lot of small businesses that were locally owned and operated. Uh, but you, uh, you kind of lost me when you said you want to get rid of income taxes. I think one of the ways that we can, one of the serious problems we have is a serious maldistribution of wealth in this country. Much too much power at the top, many rich people at the top, and a lot of people with very little or nothing at the bottom. And one of the ways, probably the best way to even this out, one of the best ways is with taxes. Economic opportunity for people at the bottom is also very important in education. But uh, having, having a tax system which redistributes would be helpful. And, and the best way to do that, I think, is with, first of all, with an income tax, which you don't want, and with property taxes, not just real estate property, but, but a net worth tax. I think we need a net worth tax in this country as well as an attempt to, to even things out and to recognize the fact that the people who are doing very, very well are doing very, very well because of the environment they're in, the economic environment that they're in, which we all play a part in. Um, so that, that kind of summarizes my view of that. Now, Charlie says there's no such thing as natural law. Uh, you know, obviously he's never been in an avalanche or anything like that or a bad storm at sea. And it's also obvious that he was never, that he was never married because if he was married, he would certainly understand that there very much is natural law. Thank you. All right. Any other rebutters? Any other rebutters? Okay, uh, Joe, you get your final word. Take a little time and I'll... Uh... So thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. Sorry I so much text. I'm surprised I put this together in time. Um, so I just wanted to address the last thing, though, that um, I support... I support repealing the income tax because I don't believe they're earning money. It's a crime and shouldn't be treated as a crime. And taking people's money on that, that, that would be an involuntary servitude because then they have to work more to earn that money again. But there's a difference between earned income and unearned income. I think labor uh, <clears throat> wages earned from labor is earned income. And business activity that you engage in with government assistance, in my opinion, is unearned income. And I think unearned income should be taxed, but only in proportion to how much assistance you got from the government while you made that money because you didn't really earn it. So I support basically fining people for crimes to fund the government in, in, instead of taking away the people's property value to fund the government. We can argue about the verbiage of that, but that's why I support appealing income tax. Okay. okay. I know, sorry, just to, to get to a few things that Charlie said. Um, Cooperative farming is a good idea. It actually decreases the monopoly of land ownership because it's multiple people owning it instead of one person owning it. So it's more monopoly. Um, and I didn't mean to imply that every industry or sector in the economy is monopolized. Farming is clearly not monopolized based on the evidence you provide. But if you think about it, in any industry, you can point to someone and say, that's the guy with the most of that. Well, Bill Gates is the guy with the most land. U.S. military is the agency with the most land. So land is being monopolized. It's, just, it's a near monopoly. I'm not implying that any of these things are total monopoly, except in the state of, in the case of like the state, you know, the regulatory monopoly. And just to clarify, the reason I'm saying that patents and contracts and things are exclusive, uh, exclusive contracts, exclusive property, violent property, is because patents are a temporary monopoly um, to use an invention. And who enforces that? The police. They call it enforcement because force is used to enforce that. Because violence is the only tool the police have besides convincing someone to abide by the law voluntarily. There's a lot of laws that exist that don't even apply to all people. Like half of the titles in the U.S. code only apply to certain classes of people, but we think it applies to everyone. So <clears throat> we're obeying a lot more laws than we actually have to. So the idea that 
I didn't mean to downplay the seriousness of totalitarian governments uh, using state violence against people, but I also want to make sure, I, 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 my worry is that Charlie is almost articulating the viewpoint of if our government does it, then it's not violence. And I don't want to endorse that. I hope he's not saying that. But I do believe that Mox Faber's definition of the state is an agency capable of building a legitimate monopoly over the use of violence in order to achieve its goals. So it does use violence even by the very definition. Obama gave a 2009 interview where he affirmed that he believes that's it. ridiculous. So it's still the definition of the state. That's my opinion. Thank you okay. for that. Completely ridiculous. Charlie, why don't you go ahead and gamble us out? Gamble All us right. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I hope you learned something. And if you want to know about labor law, get a union representative and talk to them. And be cautious about what you get from, I, I love this. You're supposed to get, read a newspaper about your rights at work. I doubt that. Anyhow, thanks, Joe. Let us know when you got another one in you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.